Welcome to Crime on Caffeine. I'm your host, Erica. And I'm your host, Allison. Thank you so much for tuning into another episode. Today, we'll be sipping on a coffee that I found at Target because I've been spending way too much time at Target. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Literally. It's called the Black and Bold. I got the specialty coffee. And then, lucky for me... Well, not really lucky for me, but lucky for Erica, I found that they had it on Amazon too. So she was able to get some as well. Yeah, I got the warm up, which is part of their partnership with the NBA, which is really cool. But I got the Eastern Conference blend and it's kind of caramely, kind of sweet, but it's really good. And for every purchase of the NBA partnerships, um, the NBA matches 5% of Black and Bold's contribution, which Allison can tell you guys about. Black and Bold pledges 5% of its profits to initiatives aligned to sustaining youth programming, enhancing workforce development, and eradicating youth homelessness. So they are amazing. And I'm going to tell you what, I got me the dark roast because you know how it be. And... They're amazing and their coffee's amazing. I'm still <laughs> sipping on my peppermint mocha coffee creamers because it's still Christmas in my eyes. You're okay. I don't even know what coffee cream you're supposed to drink in the spring and summer. I'm not drinking the Peeps one. I know that. <laughs> <Ew>. <laughs> it's also technically still winter, so we're good. Exactly. I'm still burning my winter scented candles. Suddenly, I can't hear anything. Oh, good. <laughs> Suddenly, I can't hear anything. <laughs> Guys, Erica's headphones just went What's out. What's happening? Oh, my God. Uh, Are you just reading my lips? Can you read my lips? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How can you hear me? True. Okay. Um. Anyway, I hope you guys got a lot of coffee for Christmas, and I hope you guys had an amazing Christmas. And we got a wonderful Christmas present because we hit 10K downloads. Yes! Downloads. Oh my gosh. That's Ooh. insane that we're ending the year with 10,000 downloads. We put out our first episode in the middle of May. I think it was like May 17th or something. And here we are like six, seven months later with 10,000 downloads. That's amazing. Thank you guys so much. Yes, thank you guys so much. And of course, right after Erica texted me and she said, All right, next year, 100K. <laughs> this time next year, like, 100,000 downloads. Whoa. We're making it happen. We can do it. We can do anything we put our mind to. Actually, we just, we really do need you guys on that one, though. <laughs> no, we do. So if you're still interested in winning our. 10k giveaway it's still going on through the end of the year it's going to end at midnight on new year's eve so if you haven't already entered it's really easy all you have to do is show your support for the show on social media you can post yourself listening to our podcast on apple music on spotify on amazon on audible on Stitcher, anything any way you listen to your podcast, post it on your Snapchat story, post it on your Instagram story, wherever, tag us and you will be entered to win. Yes. I love seeing people tag us. It's my favorite part of the day. If you guys have a New Year's resolution of starting a podcast, well, let me just tell you. So we use Buzzsprout and it has been so, so easy for us to use, like, we had no idea what we were doing when we started this, I'll be honest, but Buzzbout has made it super easy for us and it's a great way to access all of our stats and analytics and just great to have everything in one place. So if you guys are interested in using Buzzsprout, we are going to have a link in our bio and it's going to be in the episode description. Click that link and if you decide to use Buzzsprout for your podcast, you'll get a $20 Amazon gift card. Love that. What? Right? Isn't that so nice? Yes. Guys, Buzzsprout is the poo, so take a big whiff. And they have other features where they will literally mix the sound for you so that your podcast sounds its best. And honestly, it integrates with Canva. So if you have podcast art, you can just get it straight from Canva. Whatever you need to do, it's all in one place. 
Yeah, and they'll also integrate your sponsorships. Not that we have any, but once we get some, (laughs) we'll be able to add them in there. (laughs) So if you're listening and you have a product or a business and you want us to promote it on your show, let us know because we will. We do have a very important true crime update for this week that I wanted to discuss. Um, It's a very recent case. On December 12th, 23-year-old Lauren Smith Fields was found unresponsive in her Bridgeport, Connecticut apartment. She had been on a date with a man that she met from Bumble the night before. Now, I just want to point out, it was a white man. That is all we know about him, literally. In fact, this man was the one who contacted police regarding Lauren's condition, and she obviously later passed away. But he was not looked at as a suspect. He wasn't even brought in for questioning. Why? Well, officers allegedly stated that he was a nice man who didn't need to be questioned. You're fucking me right now. That's not... I don't care if he read to blind, sick children every single day. Like, I don't care if he is the nicest human being on the planet. He was with her when she died and called the police to report it. Whether he had anything to do with it, he needs to be questioned so that they have any information on for the investigation whatsoever. This is inexcusable. Trust me, I studied crime and procedure in college and i think everybody on this planet understands the first steps of the investigation i don't like i don't understand and the worst part about this doing a google search on this case was so tough i cannot find the man's name it has not been released and people on the internet work really hard to figure that shit out and it still has not been released even trying to just find articles on this case was impossible Type in her name, Lauren Smith hyphen Fields. I think the biggest news source that I saw was Yahoo News, and it wasn't until like the second page. There is no one is talking about this case. We don't know this man, who this man is, anything about this man. And my heart breaks for the family because they have been begging the police to get their shit together and figure out what's going on. Police solve this case. We need to know what happened to our daughter. They were like, She doesn't do drugs. There is no reason why she would just unresponsive in her room with like some random guy that she met the night before on a date from an internet app. And it was to the point where the police department literally told the family to stop calling. Shut up. Yeah. Yeah. And also Lauren's mother, Chantel Fields, wrote a super detailed heartfelt email to the police just like asking them to fucking investigate or something. And they just like didn't respond. They completely ignored it. This is the type of thing that needs to blow up the way that the Gabby Petito case did. This poor family needs justice. Her cause of death hasn't been released. And the family confirmed, you know, like I said, they said she's not a drug user. And they mentioned that they actually ended up paying out of pocket for a second private autopsy because of their level of discomfort with the way the case was handled. And I don't blame them. And I was just like, I was researching this, trying to find every single article that you read is the exact same. It has the exact same information in it. Every single paragraph is the same. And there was actually one article that I read from uh, News Onyx, which is a black news publication. And they point out that if you Google Bridgeport Police Department and racism, a lot comes up. They've had a lot of issues in the past let's see i saw they had some issues happening this year and i saw things all the way back to like 2013 so i think everybody should share this case if you see something on our story about it or if you see something anywhere on tiktok something share it because this needs to blow up the same way that the gabby petito case did it needs to be talked about more and this family needs answers and we need this man's name yeah we need his name like yesterday come on So for Christmas, my sweet, sweet brother-in-law, Eli, got me a book, you know, a nice book by the name of Serial Killers and Psychopaths. Um, Just a light read, you know, to open with your stocking and a cup of coffee (laughs) on Christmas morning. Happy, happy, happy. Um, No, I'm seriously obsessed with it. It's a great book. But then the whole day, all Christmas day, we all were talking about, you know, good old serial killers. And I was telling them that I do a lot of cases based off of movies or movies that were based off of cases. And his girlfriend, Maya, told me about a case that is kind of centered around the movie Jaws. Do you know anything about it? No, I don't. I didn't either. And Jaws is not only one of my husband's favorite 
movies of all time. It's on his list, you know. <laughs> it is a family favorite of like his cousin, like everybody. We all love Jaws. And I'm like, how the hell did none of us know about this? How is it possible? It is called The Lady of the Dunes. I don't know if I've heard of it. I need like names. I'm not going to be able to give you any names because as Erica stated before, if we hit 10K, I would do an unsolved case. And here I am. So not only is this a movie based case, it is also an unsolved case. That is going to drive me crazy for the rest of my life, like all the other ones that you guys make me do. But you're in for it, guys. There is a lot going on here. There's a lot going on, but there's also nothing going on, <laughs> if that makes any sort of sense. Yeah, that's. I think there's like three cases that I've written where I'm so excited and I start writing and I'm like, I don't even have enough to like write a full case. Like I can't oh, even Oh yeah, nothing happened. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going <laughs> to. Give you all the information. That all this the is going to be a quick five-minute episode. I'm going to give you a description and done. No, I'm just kidding. I give you a description of the case, and then I'm going to go into some conspiracy theories. And then at the end, I did plug in one teeny tiny little bit of psychology because there's really no psychological profile with this. I'm sorry if you hear Thor breathing into the mic. He just like walked up to I it for a second. He's got something to say. He said, Allison, stop talking and just get on with the damn case. On July 1974, 12 year old Leslie Metcalf, her family, and a group of her friends were walking their dogs on the back of Province Lands Visitor Center after a day of hiking. One of the dogs suddenly became pretty excited, agitated, just a lot of emotions, and it just went running. Leslie followed it, and then she came upon a cluster of trees near Race Point Beach in Provincetown, Massachusetts. There was a woman laying on the ground, dead. The woman was young, white, had pink painted nails, and a glittery hairband holding back kind of a reddish-brown colored hair. She was lying face down on a green towel. There was a blue bandana that had been tucked beneath her head, and the left side of her head had been almost completely crushed to the point of decapitation. There was a pair of Wrangler blue jeans folded up like a pillow, and at the end of each arm where her hands should have been, there were piles of pine needles. Whoever killed her left her body just a few feet from sand roads that were usually kept to explore the coast. The whole area was covered in blood. The thing that made this case so hard for investigators was that her hands were severed and taken. So this was obviously to try to prevent anybody from identifying her. Investigators estimated that the woman was somewhere between 25 and 35 years old. She weighed between 140 to 150 pounds. She was about 5'6 to 5'8, and she had been dead for at least 10 days, maybe even as long as three weeks. After closer examination, investigators determined that the head injury caused by an object like a military entrenchment tool had likely killed the young woman. What does that mean? Apparently, an entrenching tool is like a digging device used by the military. Authorities also found that the woman was sexually assaulted, but after her death and by some kind of wooden block. Oh, ew, eh, no, 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 no. Well, the person clearly didn't want to have any kind of DNA situation, so they cut off her hands, they assaulted, assaulted her, her with a wooden block, block all the all bad, the bad things. things. A retired police chief noted that she had about $10,000 worth of gold crowns in her mouth, and the dental work she had done was what they call a New York style. Through the years, authorities have exhumed the woman's remains twice, once in 1980 and once in the year 2000, as DNA technology had progressed and reconstructions had been done to try to capture what she looked like before she was killed. The face of the Lady of the Dunes had been reconstructed multiple times. The first reconstruction was a clay model, and then over the years, they later 
did, you know, computer technological sketches of her face so that they could be more accurate. In 2006, age regression drawings of the woman were made. In 2010, the police chief of Provincetown, Jerron, worked with a forensic analysis from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and the Smithsonian's National Museum of History to re-examine the case of the Lady of the Dunes. They placed her skull in a CT scanner, and the team was able to build a possible image of her face. I will have the sketches, I will have the, you know, image, I'll have all of that on the website because there's multiple different kinds. A retired police chief named Tobias, who had been involved with the case as an investigator and more recently as a civilian, said, after 44 years, we still don't have that answer. They have no idea who did this. Sadly, no one has ever claimed her. I never understand that. How could a woman be murdered, honestly, in this crazy manner? And not one person has any connection to her, is missing her. She Does she have a family? Where Where, where is everybody? I know. I was going through John and Jane Doe's different states recently, and I was just thinking... There's so many cases where it's just people don't know who they are. Like, how has no one called unless the only person that they know is, like, the one who killed them? That makes sense. The Lady of Dunes was buried at St. Peter's Cemetery in October of 1974. Her tombstone reads, Unidentified female body found Race Point Dunes. How depressing is that? This poor girl, all her tombstone says is that she's just an unidentified body. And where she was found. I guess it's understandable why it's so hard to so hard to solve. I get I it just is really baffling to me that there's not anything that they could do to find out who did it or even just identify her. I feel like that's the first thing. Like at this point, we're not gonna find out who did it. But obviously her death still remains a mystery. But there are just countless theories about who could have possibly done it. The first one is that some people were speculating that the South Boston mobster James Whitey Bulger, who was a convicted murderer, they thought he had something to do with it. And then there was one woman from Maryland who contacted local police because she suspected the victim was her sister who had recently moved to Boston and vanished. But The lead was inconclusive, so that, nothing. Did she ever find her sister? I don't know. Nobody told me. And then there was that one time they thought that she might have been a victim of a serial killer named Tony Costa. Isn't that the the vampire killer? Um, The Cape Cod vampire. It couldn't have been him because he was convicted of his crimes in 1970 And he hung himself in his cell in May of 1974, and that was before she was killed. So whoever came up with that theory was very silly. Tell them. You won't. I will. Whoever came up with that theory was very silly. Come at me. Then, at another point, investigators suspected that the Lady of Dunes could be Rory Jean Kessinger, who was a known drug dealer and bank robber. Physically, Kessinger resembled the victim... And she had escaped from the Plymouth County Correctional Facility in Massachusetts the year before the woman's body was found. But because of DNA, they tested Kessinger's mother, and it was not a match. In 1978, more than a decade after she was found, a Canadian woman came forward with a really crazy confession. She believed that the unidentified woman was someone she had witnessed her father strangle while visiting Provincetown in the 70s. I just remembered a case. I'm glad that I could help you with that, but... (laughs) Sorry. I'm a little more concerned that this girl watched her father strangle somebody and we're just just then hearing about it. The Canadian authorities passed the information to the Massachusetts police, but by the time they tried to reach the woman to corroborate her story, she had moved away. So in in my head, I said, well, why didn't you just go find her and ask her? But you know... Logic has gone out the window at this point. (laughs) Another theory. In 2004, imprisoned murderer Hayden Clark confessed to killing the woman known as the Lady of the Dunes. His confession was a little suspect as he had paranoid schizophrenia 
and investigators determined that he couldn't be trusted. They also found no evidence linking him to the crime, even though he said that all the evidence that the police needed was buried in his grandfather's garden. Did they look? Yeah, it was inconclusive. (laughs) Okay. So the reason that I think people are starting to know of this case is actually because, and this is where Jaws comes in, the movie Jaws. So the author, Joe Hill, who is the son of Stephen King, who I really hope everybody knows who Stephen King is. I know who Stephen King is. Yes. So Joe Hill is his son. He has a hypothesis about the Lady of the Dunes. So he first detailed his hypothesis in a blog post in August of 2015. And then part of that came popular because of a podcast called Inside Jaws. His theory was that before she died, she was an extra in the film. So he was watching the movie and highlighted that at the moment of 54 minutes and two seconds. Oh, please. During a crowd scene, there was an extra, a fit, young-looking woman with brunette hair wearing a blue bandana who had a very startling resemblance to the composite sketch of the lady. Did they figure out who this extra was? So, I will get into that. Joe told... USA Today, in a phone interview, she swims at you out of the crowd. You hardly notice her if you watched it on TV, but it's different if all the actors are 10 feet high. Because he was watching this at the actual movie theater when it was released back into theaters on its anniversary. I think it was the 40-year anniversary. So he went with his two sons. He's watching it on on the big, giant projector screen, and he was like, oh my god, it's her. He wondered, what if the young murder victim no one has ever been able to identify has been seen by hundreds of millions of people in a beloved summer classic, and they didn't even know they were looking at her. He also acknowledged multiple times that she also was not wearing those Wranglers that were found. He also noted that the blue bandana was worn by six other women in the following sequence of the movie. So he's the devil's advocate. That's what he's doing with his own theory. So production on Jaws had attracted a lot of local curiosity, and the filming was relatively close to where her body was eventually found, and it occurred not too long before the movie had released. He wrote, It would be no surprise at all if if the girl was summering on the Cape and she decided for a few days to go explore Martha's Vineyard, especially because, obviously... There were celebrities there. There was a movie being filmed there. It's a very enticing thing to do if you're in the area. Later, in a blog post he wrote, he talked to an FBI agent about his idea, and the agent wrote, You know, it might be worth going forward with your theory. There might be something in it. Otter ideas have cracked colder cases. He told the Washington Post, My thing is writing ghost stories. I can't tell if this is my imagination just doing the thing that it always does or if there's actually something there. Joe really would like to see her DNA submitted to a genealogical database to possibly track down her relatives so that they could identify her, which is something that me and you just talked about not that long ago. Where is her mommy? Where's her daddy? Where are all her people? Wait, so have they done that yet? When did he say that? All of these things that came from him happened from 2015 to about 2019. Okay. The case's lead investigator, Provincetown Police Detective Meredith Labor, spoke with People Magazine but declined to go into detail about her work. She said anything that generates interest is always good. Hill agrees that everything should be followed up on. He said there are people alive today who were in that shot in Jaws, and they know they're in that shot. So he's basically saying all of these people were around. How come nobody's come forward and said, oh, I know who this girl is, or these are the people that I was with during the filming of the movie. He continued by saying, he continued by saying, two astonishing things happened in Cape Cod in the summer of 1974. One is the Steven Spielberg filmed Jaws, and the other is that someone murdered this woman in the dunes outside Provincetown and got away with it. Anything that stirs someone's memories could potentially be productive. Tobias, who joined the Provincetown Police Department that same summer, 
later took over the case in 1989 and worked on it until retiring in 2009. He's still involved as a civilian, as I said earlier, and is actively working to, you know, close in on promising angles. And he also declines to elaborate just as Meredith declines to elaborate, which I find a little bit suspicious. He did, however, reply, do I think it's her? I don't know. Is there a resemblance? Yeah, I think some, but it has the 70s. I mean, hundreds of thousands of young women dress that way. Blue jeans and bandanas and their hair down. Is it possible? Sure. Is it likely? Probably not. Just the mathematical odds. So this is what you were asking. Studio records weren't helpful. The Post reported that decades ago, extras were not as meticulously tracked by the producers who hired them, and an Entertainment Weekly reporter was unsuccessful in gaining any more information from the Universal Archives. Damn. I know. The film's casting director passed away, so he doesn't have any information, obviously. We can't get from him. Tobias thinks that perhaps the lady wasn't from the county and was from somewhere else completely. Perhaps she was an orphan and maybe she didn't have any family. I just don't see an orphan with no family walking around in like a cute outfit in Cape Cod with their nails painted. I just, I don't know. I mean, I'm with you. I don't think that makes sense at all. But also, it doesn't make sense that nobody yeah. gave to, like, has no idea who she is or nobody reported her missing. All of it is just very spish. Tobias also said, I can tell you that the Provincetown Police Department is not giving up on this. As of today, the case is still open and being worked on by the Provincetown Police Department. Detective Meredith Labour has asked, please encourage anybody with any information to please reach out. All possible leads will be investigated. You can reach them at 508-487-1212. And that is why I don't do unsolved cases. We do have a because. big um, amount of listeners that live in Massachusetts, so let us know what you think about this case. If there's anything that we didn't mention that you know about just from living there, or what your thoughts are, what you think happened. Yeah, because I am just baffled. There's nothing. I Like, there's literally nothing. I just did a case that had nothing. There was one thing that I did want to go over psychologically, because I just feel like... I haven't talked about this before. Obviously, I've talked about like necrophilia and whatever, all that great stuff that also happened to her. But have I talked about the psychology of murder concealment acts? So like mutilation murder. So according to the NCBI, they had an article that was named the psychology of murder concealment acts. So I will just go over one paragraph of it that explains different types of mutilation murder. So mutilation murder is defined as those homicides where the offender tried to dismember the victim. Gunn and Taylor emphasize that dismemberment is a relatively rare method where after killing the victim, the perpetrator uses a very sharp cutting weapon, saw or axe or... In this case, we're not really sure if the military shovel was part of it, but they sever the limbs and cut the body into small pieces. The act of mutilation murder can be classified into defensive, aggressive, offensive, and necromantic types. While defensive mutilation murder relates to the motive of hiding, moving, getting rid of evidence, or making identification of the victim difficult, Aggressive mutilation murder is associated with aggressively strong emotions. And then on the other hand, offensive mutilation murder is known as the lust and necrosadistic murder, whereby dismemberment of the body epitomizes the cruelty of the act. And then as for necromantic mutilation murder, the dismemberment of body parts is regarded as a trophy, symbol, or fetish. So going over that, we can tell that this was a defensive mutilation murder because they were trying to hide, move, get rid of evidence, making the identification of a victim difficult. So there you have it. That's really all I had to go off of other than this person. It just clearly is, it's disturbing to say, but like brilliant because there's absolutely nothing. I want to know about the DNA. Like I want to know if they ever submitted that. 
So as far as I saw, there's nothing as of right now other than what I already went over. So I know that they wanted to do the genealogical DNA and then they keep kind of resubmitting it as technology goes on. If there are any updates in the future, though, we will provide them. We sure will. And I hope there are because this is driving me insane. That's crazy. I never knew that. I've never heard of this, like, with the whole relation to Jaws thing. It's interesting. I haven't either. That's all I got. Thank you guys so much for listening. Don't forget to follow us on Spotify and rate us five stars because you can now rate shows on Spotify. So please do that if you have not. And if you haven't given us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, you can do that as well and subscribe while you're at it. Yes. Thank you guys so much. And again, the 10K download giveaway is still going on until the first of the year. So you have a little itty bitty bit of time left. And we just really want to thank you for continuing to support us and getting us to 10K downloads. And we just want to continue doing this for you guys. So blow it up, guys. Blow it up. But in a nice way. And we hope you guys have an amazing new year and we hope everybody is staying safe and healthy. And yeah, thank you so much. And with that being said, we will see you guys in 2022.